All right, let's see if we can do this again. And Instagram, sorry, I might have to edit some of this out because you know, the technical stuff is always a pain in the neck in the beginning. All right, good. So while we're getting all this together, anybody on Instagram have any questions about the, uh, the workshop or just any questions in general? So like I said, we're on video number three of the workshop, and that's the one that gets really deep into technique and starts ironing out how I work on rhythm accents and sticking. Um, those are my two big categories. If you break all drumming down to its barest essentials, that's what you get. Rhythm being your notes, accents, your louds and softs, dynamics, and sticking, your order of rights and lefts, feet, sound sources, all that kind of stuff. Uh, everything else in drumming is kind of derivative of those two, th of those three things. So, okay, we're back on YouTube. Let's see. How about now? Sound okay? Let's see if anyone... Oh, looks like I'm getting a bar now where it actually shows the volume. That's kind of good. All right. Good. So now I'm going to try to be a little bit more on top of this microphone because these are all just internal. So whatever's happening is happening. So you guys can hear me better. Good. Thank you. Appreciate that. So see, we figured it out. Um, yeah. So anyone's got any questions, feel free to shoot them in. I'm going to monitor the comments and, uh, and we'll take it from there. Uh, like I said, I'm kind of a... Uh, on vacation <laughs> so taking a break and trying to uh get this stuff done but yeah um i love the third video of the workshop it's my favorite one because that really gets into the nuts and bolts of everything that i teach here and of course if anybody wants to continue on past that you know i'll, I'll be opening up my website thedrummersalmanac.com right after that hey luke how we doing good and um yeah, that, and that's that's a really nice community of drummers that we get in there. We practice. We work on all our stuff. Uh, every Tuesday, we get together on Facebook in a private group and do a live like this, except there's other people in there, and we all interact and talk about our playing and talk about our practicing. It's a great community. Uh, a lot of fun. Good. So if there's no questions, I'm going to start talking a little bit about that third video in the workshop. Uh, I call it the PATH workshop because it kind of outlines the PATH of practicing from you know beginner all the way up through you know if you're Vinny Kaliuta, everybody's on the same path. Everybody is working towards the same kind of goals with their playing. Um, and even if somebody like Vinny has been through it, now, whether you know Vinny or not, if you want to say you know Neil Peer or you want to say John Bonham, everybody's on the same path. All right. So um, John Bonham playing triplets is no different than you playing triplets. You know Neil Peer playing thirty second notes is no different than you playing thirty second notes. A uh, big thing I see with students is they have this thing in their head like oh i can't play rush or i can't play dream theater or i can't play you know zappa <laughs> or anything like that because i can't do what Vinny does i can't do what neil does i can't do what fill in the blank drummer does because he's just so good and they're defeated before they even try to do it when you have to realize that anything that those guys are doing is just rhythm accents and sticking that's it that's all they're doing you know, they're the same notes, they're the same stickings, they're the same accents. So if you learn that stuff and you hone it and you get it together, you should be able to play anything any of those guys can play. And at one point, any of those guys have been at the level that you're at as well. So I know for me, I had a big thing with Weckl when I was a kid. I loved Dave Weckl. And it, to me, it was like, well, I can't play that because Weckl plays that. So it must be something different. It must be some kind of other dimensionally way of thinking. Uh, and that's a terrible way to... Um, you know, to think when it comes down to it. Okay, I've got some questions here. Let's take a look. Uh, so let's see. Just started learning notation and rudiments yesterday after nearly 30 years. Good for you. Yeah, good for you. You know, they, you're never too old to learn anything. That's a great thing to get into. Again, do you have to know how to, how to read music to be able to play drums? No, but it's an amazing tool. It's a shortcut. It'll get you to where you want to get to much quicker. Same thing goes with studying. If you study with a great drummer, you're going to cut through a lot of the BS to get to a straighter path to where you want to be. So good for you. That's great. Um, what do you tune your toms to? Uh, let's see. Um, I don't tune them to anything. I tune the drum to themselves. All right. I like to, to make sure the drums are in tune with each drum. I don't set them to a pitch, if that's what you're asking. Some guys do that. Some guys, if they're in a session, will tune their toms to the key of the song. Uh, I don't like doing that. I find that you're going to run into problems if you start doing that because now if like you drop a little bit out of tune halfway through the song, you're going to hear that, you know, 
Whereas if the drums are just in tune with themselves and they're just a pitch, not the pitch of the, or the key of the song, um, the drums just sound great and you don't have to worry about it. As far as drums in relation to each other, again, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of stuff on the internet. If you look at tuning, like what are the intervals? Should it be a minor third? Should it be a fourth? Should it be, you know, between the rack tom and the floor tom? Should it be a sixth? You know, everyone's got a different difference of opinion. My way of thinking has always been more simplistic. It's making making the drum resonate and sound good for itself and then make sure they sound good between each other. You know, once they feel good to me, uh, I kind of call it a day. You know, I don't sit there and overthink it all that much. Um, okay, start a learn rotation. We got that. that. That's what I'm saying. You know, if you, if you could go crazy with tuning. You could go crazy. And I, and I have. I've spent hours and hours tuning drums sometimes. And something like, you know, I, I was using these Pearl drums that I restored. And they look great. And in the past, they've sounded great. I think that Rack Tom needs new bearings. Uh, I just can't get it in tune. It will not stay in tune. I'll get it to sound good, and within like 30 seconds, it doesn't sound good again. It doesn't sound good across the microphone. So I switched my toms back to the GMS toms, and the problem was solved. So it's the drum. You know, it's the drum itself. So, I mean, you could go crazy with tuning, and, and sometimes the answer is a different head or a different drum, um, especially when you're in the studio, different microphone. There's so many factors that you know, set that up. A lot of people say to me, man, that snare drum sounds great. Uh, and then another person will say, man, it's a horrible sounding snare drum. And they're the same snare drum in both videos. But one, I spent more time tuning and EQing and compressing on. <laughs> and the other one, I didn't. So it's like, it's really not the drum's fault. Sometimes it's the production that makes the drum sound great. So th there's a lot of factors that, that you got to learn with this stuff. Okay, Instagram, let's take, I don't want to ignore you here. Let's Okay, you need more attention on this app. We saw that one. Thank you, Carter. I do appreciate that. Uh, no questions there yet. Let's see. Anything over here? And again, I'm sorry for being so late, guys. I know this is kind of late. Normally, I do it during the day. But since we're out in Panama City, we are on the beach all day with my, <laughs> with my two little girls. I got two four-year-old twins that you guys have probably seen in some of the videos here and there. Uh, so we were, we were playing away in the sand and the surf and having a little bit of fun. I did manage to do one TikTok today from the beach. So that was pretty fun. And that was on tuning too, incidentally, about tuning the snare drum. So somebody asked about that. Uh, great content. I love, love watching your videos. Oh man, thank you so much. I appreciate that. You know, that, that's, that's the reason why I do it, man. Honestly, um, I love doing this because as a teacher, you know, a lot of drum teachers only get to teach a certain amount of drummers throughout their career, you know? But doing this gives me the, the ability to teach a much bigger audience, you know? And the biggest thing with me with teaching uh, and sharing the information that I've learned is, is the idea that seeing students or seeing just any drummers, you know, rising up to and having something to do with that, you know? To me, that's, that, that's the biggest high I could possibly get. It's akin to like a songwriter, you know, hearing a hit song that they wrote on the radio. It's like they hear it for the first time when I... I get a student of mine that says, I just got signed to a record deal. You know, that, that to me is like the best compliment you could possibly get, you know? So yeah, this, this, you guys watching these videos, you know, following, commenting, uh, it's, it's, it's really the fuel that keeps everything going. So definitely appreciate it. Very cool. All right. Hey, waving to everybody on Instagram. Hey guys, how we doing? Again, I only have my stands here, so this is like a really ghetto setup right now. I have this. This thing is like propped up on the computer. I got the computer sitting right here. I have a bar stool with a pillow and a cutting board and my Vic Firth chop outs. <laughs> That's from using a pad. So if you guys don't have a pair of Vic Firth chop outs, you need to get a pair of these. These are the most valuable thing I've ever used in terms of traveling. So it's a pair of Vic Firth 5B sticks, but it's got this rubber tip. You see that? And that feels like a pad. I mean, that's the same material a drum pad is made of. So any hard surface actually gives you a good rebound. And you can kind of practice anywhere. It's, it's a total genius. They actually sell the rubber tips also if you want to add them to a different set of sticks. But these are the kind that actually are glued onto the stick. But man, these are, these are killing. So let's see. Should I buy a big fat snare drum or is that a waste of money? Well, you know what? As far as gear goes, I'm 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 kind of a bad person to ask because I've never been a big gear guy. I've never been the guy to run out and get a new set of snare drums, a new set of drums, a new set of pedals, a new set of high. I mean, I run my gear to the ground. When it's falling apart and not working anymore, then it's like, oh, I gotta go get a new pedal. You know, that's the way I got the same way with the cymbals. I think I've I bought 
you know, the last symbol I bought was probably about 10 years ago because <laughs> I just, I run them into the ground. I use them forever. Um, but should you do that? I mean, you could get a, a cheap snare drum and fix it up and make it sound great. You could get a used snare drum. I mean, if you're looking to save money, you could go on Craigslist or, or offer up or one of those apps and, and see what someone's got, especially if you're just starting out with gear. Um, if you know what you're doing, you could always put a new head on a snare drum. You know, a snare drum doesn't have to be brand new. Same good thing goes for any drums. People think that, you know, you can't change the head. If the heads are shot, that that's nothing. You just put, put, put new heads on there and it's a brand new drum a lot of the times. Now, in my case, the drums that I refinished, if you look on YouTube, I refinished those uh, those Pearl drums. Like I said, I think there's a bearing edge problem. So I got to work on next, figuring out how to do the bearing edges, either sending it out or doing it myself. But um, that's going to be a problem. But if the drum is in good shape, um, you don't have to spend a million dollars on drums. Now, now, that being said, I have gone to the music store and I remember there was a snare drum that I hit and it was a sonar and I've never bought a sonar drum, but I hit it and I was, I fell in love with the feel of it. I fell in love with how it sounded and used. It was a pre-owned drum. They wanted $850 and they wouldn't budge on the price. I said $850 for this used drum. They're like, yeah, it was about $1,500 new. <laughs> I was just like, I said, my, my drum set didn't cost $1,500 and you want $1,500 for a snare, but I loved it so much. I put money down on it and then I paid it down until I owned it, you know, and that was kind of what I did. Uh, and I love that snare drum. You know, it's, it's a sonar, it's a tank. I don't take it anywhere because it's so heavy, but <laughs> it's a great sound and drum. So sometimes if you find something that you fall in love with, you know, it's worth the investment. Uh, and like I said, I, I have my gear forever. So I don't. I, <laughs> I very rarely replace my gear. Uh, I really should. And everyone's been making fun of me on the most recent videos because even my drum heads. I have an endorsement with Evan's drum heads. So I get my drum heads for next to nothing. All I gotta do is call them, <laughs> and then they'll send me all set of heads. And I'm just I'm so bad with gear. Uh, I really do. I wait till everything is falling apart before I change it. Uh, not a great thing. Okay, it would be a big upgrade from from the painter's tape I'm using right now. <laughs> Hey, listen, whatever works. Nothing wrong with a little painter's tape. Okay, even on vacation, you're practicing. That's what's up. Yep, man, you never stop. What's up? There's my buddy, Skinny George. George Martinez. Everyone say hi to George and follow him. George is a monster, monster player. Uh, George is on YouTube. He's definitely on Insta and he's on TikTok uh, and crushing it. Uh, doing all that he's going through, all the rudiments. You got to check out some of his videos. I do edit him as often as I can, and I always plan along to his routines because they are just great warm ups. So definitely check out George. Um, and good to see you on one of my lives because I'm always in, on yours. <laughs> all right, very cool. Let's see what's happening here on YouTube. We got a couple more questions. Uh, let's see. Oh, let's go ahead and look at it. We saw that one. Okay. Uh, good evening. Indian rhythms, I, you know, listen, I love the Indian rhythms, absolutely. Have I ever formally studied them? No, I never have. Not, you know, not in terms of the language, because there's the whole language associated with that, the whole, you know, learning how to speak the language before you can even touch a tabla. And I do know some guys that have studied in that world. Uh, and I love my favorite guy in that vein is, is Treelock Urtu, if you guys listen to Treelock. I love Treelock. Um, got into him when he played with John McLaughlin. I even got to see him once. Um, great percussionist. I mean, the guy is like on a different planet, the way he thinks of rhythm. Uh, but I like to equate the Indian rhythms, you know, rhythm is rhythm. You might call it something different. And in, in, in the West, we, we say one Enda, you know, we say we have different like versions, but it's the same idea. It's, you know, fitting a certain amount of rhythms or notes into a beat. The Indian stuff tends to break it up a little bit more thoroughly than Western music does. And that's what I like. That's why I try to borrow from the Indian stuff. So if you notice from some of my videos, I'm doing a lot of uh, subdivisions, like say a quintuplet or a fivelet. I call it a fivelet. I don't like to say quintuplet or a septuplet or any of that tuplet nonsense. Um, I say sevenlet, I say fivelet. I like to keep it as simple as I can for my students. And a five-year-old understands fivelet. They don't understand, you know, septuplet or pentuplet or anything like that. Um, so I, I keep the terminology simple. But yeah, so if I'm playing like this, That would be your quintuplet, right? Your fivelet. But I don't count it one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one. That's how a lot of my teachers taught me. Uh, I don't like that because you have to count to five real fast. And if I can't say it, physically say it fast, it, it's harder to play. 
So the way I count five lists or seven lists, uh, I'll use the same terminology I use for say 16 notes. So one enda, one enda, two enda, three is your 16 note. So for quintuplets, I do one enda and I add an e, one enda e. Okay. And some guys like to do an extra end, one enda end. That's fine too. I don't care what you say, as long as it is a different enough syllable that it's nice and clear when you say it. You can do it fast. One enda, two enda, three enda, four enda, one enda, two enda, three enda, four enda, one. Also, if you're trying to accent through that phrase, since you understand how to say those individually, it helps you play them and execute them a lot cleaner, at least for me. Now, you have to practice that. It takes time to understand how to say one E and E, two E and E, three E and E. But eventually, like anything, um, you get good at it. And I like the fact that counting like that graduates the number. One E and E, two E and E, three E and E, four E and E. So I know where I am in the measure, just like a 16 note. Okay, same thing with a seven lit or, you know, the septuplet. I count that like you'd count 30 second notes. One E and E and E for a 30 second note. One E and E and E and two E and E and E. But I drop out the last uh. So one E and E and E and two E and E and three E and E and E. Now there's all kinds of ways people do this. People say things like university for five lets. University, university, and that's fine. That works. You know that that'll that'll get you doing it. But again, it doesn't graduate the number. That's my biggest problem with things like that. But if your goal is just to hear it first. That's a great way to do it. The Indian language, going back to what we were talking about, um, I have that same issue where I, when I, I don't know it, but when I've heard people count it that way, it doesn't seem to graduate the numbers for me. And I, I like to know where I'm in the measure. I like to know where I'm in the beat. I'm not saying it's better or bad, worse, better, good or <laughs> that. I'm just saying that for me, the way I'm trained, I'm used to knowing where beat one, two, three, and four are in the measure. And I want to maintain that no matter what I'm playing if that makes any kind of sense. Okay, so yeah, great question. Very cool. Um, let's see what we have here. Of course, Georgia, the man. Okay, let's see what else we got. Anything else on Insta? I, I've kind of figured it was going to be a little light tonight. So I was going to keep this one kind of short. But yeah, like I said, so the crux of what I'm talking about with this lesson is where the maxims is sticking. What I, when I wanted to talk about with that topic, because I was on a live a couple of weeks ago, uh, we did my live hang, and normally we have between four and ten drummers on that. And it just came down to one Tuesday where only one guy showed up, and it's my, my buddy Angelo, who shows up to every live. And he's, he's completely killing it on my website. He posts his practice up on the Facebook group, and it's like... <laughs> the post is like that long every time and he does every single day. So he's sitting there putting in like four or five hours of practice on the pad a day, which is insane. Uh, but he's really doing it and really going through. Um, but it was just me and him. So him and I just did the, the hang together and it was almost like we did a private lesson just between me and him. Uh, and one thing he was frustrated about was he's like, look, I'm practicing these exercises over and over and over again. I do them every day and I, I work on them and I push them and I do this. He's like, but I still don't feel like I'm the kind of player I want to be. OK, so being that we, I'm talking a lot about technique and I'm talking about rhythm, accent, sticking and, and nailing that and pushing it home and saying that that's the most important thing. It's the most important thing in terms of just the basics of your foundation for technique, but it's not the most important thing. The most important thing is to be able to play drums. And if you do it right, great. If you do it wrong, but it sounds great, great. You know, there is no right or wrong. It's really a matter of what you're trying to express. That's the end. All right, Techniques, technique is the means. The end is sounding great on the drums, feeling great to the people you're playing with and to the people listening to you. That's the end that you're trying to get. And if you do that with great technique, great. If you do that with a lousy technique, great. It doesn't really matter. The technique are tools. Now, I'm not saying don't have great tools because the Lord knows if you're going to say build a house, you want to have awesome tools, right? Or the house might not come out that great. Now, if you're super talented, you might be able to build a house with a hammer, nails, and some wood. But it's going to take forever and it's going to be very slow going, <laughs> you know, you have the right tools. You're going to get the job done quickly. So that's what technique is. Technique, technique is a tool set. Uh, but the thing I said to Angelo that I want to kind of express to you guys is outcome. That's the difference between just technique, you know, and understanding how that fits into getting better on the instrument. Okay. I asked him, what's your outcome? Like, what are you trying to do? When you're practicing techniques, so you're doing stick control. What's your outcome with that? And I kind of stumped him. He didn't. He was like, "What? Well, you know, I want to get good. I want to have fast hands. Get good for what? You know, have a reason. Sometimes when you're doing this technique stuff, 
a lot of times I'll come up with an exercise because I have to learn something for say a gig or a session and I can't do it or a video. You know, there's been plenty of times where I'm like, man, I got, I'm gonna, I have this idea. I want to do a video. It's like this, but I don't know how to do that. So I come up with a, a technique practice that allows me to do that. So I have an outcome. I'm always thinking, what do I have to do practice wise to make this thing happen? So when you guys are practicing, the thing I want you to focus on is that. Know what your outcome is. Know what you're looking to do. Now, it could be different for everybody. Some guy might want to be a metal drummer. Somebody might want to be a jazz player. Somebody might want to play a particular song or a particular session or do a particular thing. That's great. But have that outcome. Have that clear. And then you go into the practice room and you're working on something for that outcome. I hope that makes sense to you guys. But, you know, something I talked about with Angelo and we, we really cleared up a lot with him. Um, and I thought maybe that would be something that would work in with you guys. And it's probably something I, I'd like to add to this workshop because I think that's one thing that is missing is the idea of knowing your outcome. Uh, definitely something I'm going to be putting to the site. So uh, let's see if we have any more questions over here. Uh, I love that, the painter's tape. <laughs> that's very funny. What I can't believe is that Instagram is working here and it's working off of my data, which is great because I thought we'd be getting all kinds of uh, messed up here. But all right, good. Well, welcome everybody. And thanks so much for checking it out. Like I said, I was gonna keep this one kind of short because I know uh, I wanna kind of just chill out. It's been a long day in the sun for me too. My girls are passed out. My wife is like on her last legs uh, and we're, <laughs> we're all kind of wiped. But listen, um, definitely check out this workshop. I'm going to leave it open probably for another week. Uh, it's been a week of the workshop. We're going to do a week of uh, opening the doors to TDA, and I'm going to be in and out of stuff like this throughout the week also to uh, answer any questions if you guys uh, want to get involved. Again, there's no pressure. If anyone ever wants to get more involved with what I, what I do, doors always open. Uh, if you want to stay on this level and just you know check out my YouTube, my Instagram, your comments and your your you know your likes and your questions it, it fuels me so thank you guys thank you so much for following everything that I do um, yeah it makes it worth it for me without a doubt so thank you so much and uh, I'll see you guys on the next one if there's no other questions I'm gonna call it a night let's see make sure I didn't miss any on Insta and on YouTube that's not how you do it. Okay, what are some of the things that are crucial from going to intermediate drummer to advanced drummer? Okay. Hey, Lee, how you doing? And this, this I'll make this one my last question because since you just popped it in there. Um, good. So going from intermediate to advanced. That, again, loaded. Intermediate and advanced are kind of subjective. You know, wh where is that line when you're intermediate versus when you're advanced? Uh, advanced could mean a lot of different things. I have some students that are advanced. Some people would consider say, someone like me or someone like George to be advanced. You know, um, is advanced like crazy? Like you think you know, Vinny Caliuta or Dennis Chambers, are they advanced? That's a, that's a term, you know? Uh, I don't think of myself on, on, you know, I think of myself as a professional. I get that all the time sometimes when people ask me, oh, you're a drummer? I'm like, oh yeah, you know, and they're like, are you good? <laughs> <laughs> like, am I good? Well, uh, some some people think I am, you know, do I think I'm good? I, what I know is I'm a professional, you know, that's how I answer. I'm a pro. I'm a pro. I can, I can do anything I need to do to get any kind of job on the drums done. That's, that's, that's the level I'm at. So um, getting from intermediate to advanced, I just think is like anything. It, it's, it's practice. It's, it's understanding and having that methodical practice and, and have done, done it so much that anything that's thrown to you, even if it's something you can't do instantly, it's something you know you could do later on. Uh, I was at a Dave Weckl clinic to tell you guys a quick story. Um, and someone asked him a question like that. They said something along the lines of, hey, Dave, can you do the left foot clave thing like Horacio Hernandez? And he is Dave Weckl, who's an amazing, you know, anyone knows Dave, he's an amazing drummer, one of the best in the world ever. And he, uh, he said, no, <laughs> he just said, everyone started laughing. He's like, no, he's like, he's like, could I do the three, two clave or two, three clave with the left foot? Sure. Have I done that in exercises? Yeah. He's like, do I have it at the level that El Negro has it? No. He's like, but that's Horatio's bag. That's what Horatio does. That's his thing. He's like, do I want, he's like, that's not my thing. 
he's like, I play Latin and I use that in my music, but I'm, I'm not in that world with the clave, with the left foot. That, that's his whole thing is that. And he's a master at that. He's like, but could I, if I wanted to, do I know I could put in the time? And if I want to take the next five years of my life and devote myself to that, could I get to that level? Sure. I know I could. And that's probably the reason why I don't care to do it. And to me, I was like, that's an amazing answer. Cause like, he was like an amazing high level professional saying something like I'm at a level where I could do anything. I know exactly the process. It's a matter of if I want to tackle that or not. You know, I, I like, I like playing double pedal for some of the things I do, but I have no desire to be a metal drummer. I mean, some of these drummers out here are amazing with the double pedal and the feet and the speed and all this stuff. It's not the kind of music I do. So could I do it? Sure. Do I care to do it? You know, if I'm called on to do it, then yes, I have to get to a certain level with it, but it's not, it's not really my thing. Um, so just keep that in mind when you talk about things like going from intermediate to advanced. Uh, a lot of that is just a matter of just having the practice under your, under your belt, having the time and the instrument, the experience. I think, you know, nothing playing with a band cannot be duplicated. You can't duplicate that, you know, in practice. You could play to records, you could play to play alongs, but unless you're on stage in front of an audience with a band playing, there's no way to duplicate that kind of practice. And that kind of spirit, experience, you need that. You need that if you want to be at a certain level, okay, to call yourself, say, a professional. Now, again, can you be advanced without having that? Yes, you could be advanced technician, but you're going to lack that experience. You know, so I think the threshold between intermediate and advanced, I'm going to say, is understanding how to practice and having that or gaining that experience, if that makes any sense. OK, good. Let's see what else we got here. Um, yeah, always a good to hear. You know, listen, no one can do everything as much as everyone says that they can do everything or they like to put on that illusion uh, that they don't make any mistakes that, you know, there's listen, we all make mistakes. You know, I always say this to, to people in my comments, especially the trolley guys that come in and have something to say. Everyone's got something to say. It's the internet. Um, but I always say, listen, if you don't pretend to be perfect, you don't have to be. And that's a beautiful thing. That's a beautiful place to live, especially when you're doing this kind of thing. All right. So if you don't pretend to be perfect, you don't have to be. Uh, and listen, I'm far from perfect. So I, I enjoy those. Uh, I enjoy the mistakes. And I enjoy leaving them in there. You know, <laughs> sometimes it happens. I leave them. You know, it's fine. All right, let's see what we got here. All right, let's see what we got. Uh, last one here. And I know I said that before, but I'll say it one more time. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I'm talking to James there. So, you know, drum music is not about perfection. It's not about being amazing. And I, again, I know a lot of people on the internet, when you see somebody and you see that Instagram clip and they sound amazing, and they're in their basement and it's like everything is flawless. You don't know how many takes that took. And, and they always have the benefit of <laughs> deleting that one and doing it again. I don't like that one. Deleting it and doing it again. Deleting it. They might have done that 150 times before they got the one that you saw. And now you're getting this idea that they sat down and sounded like that. So just bear that in mind when you watch anything on the internet. When you watch anything that's published. That it's probably not the first take. You know, there's something to be said for people that can do it on the first take. That's true. It's truly amazing, you know, when people have that. But, you know, don't get that false sense in your head that everybody on the internet is perfect or they're all better than me. How come this guy's so much better than me? You know what? You weren't there when he was recording it. So you have no idea how long it took him to get that. So, again, keep that stuff in mind and don't get defeated uh, when you when you see that kind of stuff, you know. All right. Uh, let's see. What are your usual jobs? Uh, I mean, I'm a, I'm a player. Uh, so if you're talking about jobs as far as performing jobs, playing jobs, I mean, most often these days, I'm, I'm a music director for a wedding band for an agency down here called Sam Hill uh, in Atlanta. And my company is Stage 39. They're based out of New York. And they have seven bands working right now. Uh, all We're all the same band. Okay. So all, all the bands, it's like carbon copies. All right, franchised pretty much across. So I could jump into any one of those bands and play drums and I'll know the exact same set that they're doing. I'll know exactly what to do. Uh, so we have two of these bands now in Atlanta, uh, one that I'm the dr drummer and music director for and one that I'm actually MDing right now to get them up to a certain level so they could be our sister band down in Atlanta. Uh, and then we're starting another group in um, DC with this, with this um, company. So it's, it's a really, that's a really cool situation. That takes the majority of my playing time when I play out 
Uh, plus, you know, doing weddings and club dates, it just it pays a lot more than, say, a bar gig or, or things like that. But, you know, my general rule for taking a gig, you know, and it's funny because my, my friend Jerry Z, who's a great organ player in New York, um, <laughs> and we, we had this conversation once and he said to me, you know, so for taking a gig, he's like, I, I, there's, there's three criteria I look at, you know, one, how good the players are. Am I going to be inspired by the players I'm playing with? Two, how good is the music? You know, is the music going to inspire me or is it just something that, that, you know, I'm playing on top of and I don't really care about? And three, how well does it pay? He's like, I need two of those three. I need two of those three to take the gig. Any two of those three things, and I'll take the gig. So I always thought that was a good way to, uh, <coughs> excuse me. I thought that was a good way to answer that idea of, of uh, you know, how to get work. So, all right, good. All right, everybody. So, again, thanks so much for checking it out. And uh, as I don't choke here, <coughs> um, <laughs> Remember what I said about perfection? There you go. That's it. See, I got a dry throat right now and I'm going to keep coughing. Um, have a great night. And uh, I'm going to pop those registration links underneath in the YouTube and the Instagram. Sorry, I couldn't do Facebook today, but I'm, I'm a device short and our, we don't have the bandwidth. So I'm just going to keep it on these two for now. And maybe I'll cut a version and put it on Facebook. But uh, yeah, if anyone's got any other questions, feel free to reach out to me. Normal means through the website, through the social media, and uh, we'll take it from there. Have a good night, everybody, and I'll see you in the next one.